Woo. All of us, at some time or another, have agonized over making a decision. Some decisions are major decisions. And also there are a lot of small decisions that we don't make, that they tax our minds, they drain our energy, they create a lot of anxiety and nervousness and mental torment because we don't take care of it. We decide not to decide, which is a decision. Deciding to decide, to act, is a major, major challenge for all of us at different points in different areas of our lives. And there are things that happen to us along the way, experiences that we have that prevent us from working through the mental block of acting, of doing those things that we know we ought to do. And so what I want you to think about is what is there that you know you need to do, that you want to do this, but for some reason or another, you've been holding back. For some reason or another, you just have not been able to gather your nerves or be able to work through the procrastinating or putting it off or justifying or blaming. Some reason or another, you just haven't done it. And you know you ought to do this. You really want to do this, but you don't know why you haven't done it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand, please. Okay, then I've got company here this evening. I'm not talking to myself. Now, first of all, we know that this is not easy because in order to begin to reinvent your life, you've got to make a conscious, deliberate, determined effort that you really have got to put all of yourself into it. It's very challenging to act, to do those things. There are times when you're looking at it and you say, I, I know I need to do this, but I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. I know I need to do it, yet leave me alone. No, I don't want to do it. So what do we do? What are those things that, that cause us to do like that? I think that among the things that prevent us from acting is the fear of failure. And if you've already failed, you don't want to fail again. The pain of that, the disappointment, the fear of loss is another thing. Because many times when we do those things that we know we need to do, we feel that we might lose somebody that we love very much and care about. We don't want to hurt anybody. Many of us don't act because we want other people's approval. We want everybody to like us and to accept us. And that's not possible. Many of us don't do the things that we want to do and don't act because of lack of self-confidence. We don't believe enough in ourselves. I have a friend who's been working on a job where she's miserable, talented, want to go to another place that she can do what she wants to do and make the kind of money that she would like to make and had some offers. But because of her fear and her lack of self-confidence of things might not work out, she won't take a chance on herself. So there she is spending eight hours a day, five days a week, and she's miserable. She hates to go to work. They're not paying her what she's worth. She knows it. But yet and still, she won't do that which she knows she must do, and it's wearing her out. There are a lot of people that their jobs are making them sick because they won't act. You check out the absenteeism and the people that are depressed. You see them coming to work angry. How are you doing? I don't know. <laughs> Just leave me alone. It's not even nine o'clock yet. You're talking about good morning. <laughs> there are days you go to work, you want to just keep driving past the job. You, know? <laughs> you don't want to stop because it's not in sync with who you are. But you haven't acted. Have another friend. This guy's brilliant. He's a business consultant. He helped a lot of people get their business started. And people come to him because they know he's knowledgeable. But this guy won't start his own business. Now, he's very smart. He can do it. Everybody believes in him except him. And he's so smart, he's talked himself out of it. Well, the numbers aren't right. So there are many reasons why we don't act. 
There are other things, though, that affect us. It's that not wanting to take personal responsibility. We want somebody else to do it. And we, many times, we pick up our inability to do certain things from people that we love, people that we admire. We identify with them, and we live in the context of their ideas, their opinions, and their life patterns. We buy into it unconsciously. My mother is a pack rat. She keeps everything. She doesn't throw anything away. And I have unconsciously picked that up. Now, my mother never said, let me show you how to keep everything, Les, and just clutter things. <laughs> I unconsciously picked that up. Many times, unconsciously, we try to honor the people we love by being like them. By the same token, I realized something about myself when I had some major decisions to make, and I found myself acting like my mother. See, my mother's the kind of person that when she has a problem with one of the other foster children that she adopted, she won't confront them. She will call me. <laughs> Les, why don't you tell Linda to move? <laughs> She's lazy. She won't go to work. She runs the street all day, and then she comes home and wants to sleep all day, and I think she's doing drugs. I said, but Mama, why don't you tell Linda that? I bought the house for you. I told you when she wanted to come home, don't let a grown person come there and take care of them. You let her in. Well, after all, she's my child. Mama, then you handle that. When I tell her to leave, she say, Mama say, I can say, Mama, can I say? And you tell her yes, and then you call me and say, she's still here. <laughs> Why worry me with this? So Mama hasn't developed the courage to act on that. Some people won't act until there's a crisis situation. When Linda started stealing from Mama and took her Social Security check, to get some drugs. Mama got some courage to say, get out of here. <laughs> and don't ever come back. But she wouldn't do it until then. And see, we don't have to wait until a crisis situation. I have a friend that has been having a challenge with losing weight. Both of us have been dealing with that challenge. And for the past 40 years, he's always seemed like weighed over 235 pounds. And so he said, man, I just can't lose weight. I'm big boned it. I say, bud, I've never seen any fat skeletons. <laughs> no, you need to act on your health. You can change this. You don't have to go to your grave fat. We're all digging early graves with our teeth. We don't have to do this. They need to have a support group around M&M peanuts. You want a support group on something? and throw Snickers in there too. <laughs> Bud and I can tell you about the help we need with that. So what happened with Bud though, he became ill a few weeks ago. See, Bud in the last few weeks has lost more weight than he's ever lost, even when we were competing with each other, betting a lot of money. But what happened was, Bud became diabetic. He went into an insulin shock. He didn't know that he was diabetic. His blood sugar became high. And the doctor said to him, you are diabetic. You're going to have to have insulin shots every day. You're going to have to change your diet. And let me tell you what's going to happen if you don't do what we tell you to do. Number one, there's a possibility that you can become an amputee. Number two, you can go blind. Three, you can become impotent. But say, help me. <laughs> Like those guys with, with Paul, when, when Paul broke out of jail, those guys say, tell me what I must do to be saved. <laughs> Bud were to be saved. I said, Bud, you want one of my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? No. I said, Bud, I can't believe you're eating vegetables, man. You're exercising. He said, that's right, a jogging in place too. <laughs> now he had the ability to do it before, but there's some people it takes that kind of crises to bring them into reality in order for them to act in their own best interest. Some people have to hit rock bottom in order to rise. I don't know why. You want to begin to look out on your life and what you want for you. And 
I think that when we begin to focus in the area of what does it take for us to act, I think we can say events can inspire us to act, like that particular event in his life. Circumstances, a friend of mine, he wanted to do something and, and he just did not have the motivation and the drive and the confidence within himself. But his circumstances change overnight through an acquisition of the company that he worked for. He lost his job through the inspiration of desperation. He had to act. See, life also are things that can inspire us to act. See, we don't have the courage, and that's what it takes, courage. It takes guts to do that which you know you need to do. If you don't have the courage to act, life many times will move on you and make you act. Life will whoop your butt so bad. <laughs> you will be so miserable, you will catch so much hell, you say yes. I will do it. What do you want me to do? Take me. A friend of mine said, I can't stop smoking. I can't stop smoking. Doctor said, Sam Axelrod, you have emphysema. Sam never picked up another cigarette. And said, look at those stupid people smoking. Sam, you did it for 35 years. How can you talk about people? Well, I was different. I'm, I'm trying to help them. <laughs> They don't have to do the same thing I did. But be compassionate, Sam. Isn't it interesting how quickly we forget? So I'm saying that look at something in your life. It might be just writing a letter to somebody to say thank you. It might be just to apologize to somebody. I had a confrontation in the Penobscot building with the security guard there. He responded to me what I perceived as a negative way. And he and I engaged in an argument. I did not like the way I handled that. I avoided going through the front door for a long time because I didn't want to face him. Finally, I decided to act and I went up to him and said, I want to apologize to you for the way in which I handled this argument we had the other day. I was wrong. I hope you accept my apology. He said, I do. And I said, thank you very much. I felt relieved. Now, when you decide to act, it's not always going to be like that. A friend of mine did some work for me. It was below par, to say the least. I knew that this guy was capable of doing better work. I knew that he also had a fragile ego. So I was trying to think of what is the most sensitive way in which I can share this information with him. Because I wanted him to do my work over. I was going to pay him for what he did. But I needed my work done right. But I was afraid that I would hurt his feelings. I was very, very meticulous in how I approached him. And I said, let me share this with you. You know I care about you and that you're a very talented and gifted person. And you and I both know that what you have given me is not a true reflection of your talents and abilities. And I'm saying, let's go back in the studio and do this again. And he said to me, I'm going to forget you ever said that. I was wiped out. He never spoke to me again. Now when you decide to act, you're going to have some people like that. We're no longer friends. I lost sleep over that, ladies and gentlemen. I said, I can't believe that. I, I remember st sitting up one night looking at the phone. I said, I got to call him. He said, no. Then I said, no, forget that. I called, man, look here, we've been knowing each other too long to allow this to come between us. He said, don't call me anymore, and hung up. And then I, I wanted to think about how, what can I do to make it up to him, and then something came to me, less. what do you have to prove? See, many things we don't do is, is because of the fact we want people to like us. There's some necessary losses in life. When you decide acting in your best interest, you're gonna lose some friends. Everybody's not going to approve of you. There's some people that won't like you. Who do you think you are? You're arrogant. What do you think you can do? You think you can get away with that? You're selfish. Thanks, I got that. <laughs> it's my life. And so what I'm saying to you is that as you begin to look out on your life, this is challenging. This is not easy, acting. So what are the things that we can begin to do to harness our will. Number one, you've got to bring it out and look at it. 
You've got to take the power out of it. You've got to expose it to the truth. And the truth is that it has no power over you. So write down something you want to act on, but for some reason that you've been holding back and look at it. The next thing is, ask yourself the question, is it helping you to continue to put it off? If it's an asset for you to continue to, to procrastinate, then continue to do that. But if it's a liability for you, if it's causing you some mental and some emotional challenges or perhaps a financial problem, look at that. <coughs> Examine that for what it is. Next step, ask yourself, what's blocking you? What's preventing you from acting? Why don't you have the courage to handle that? Why won't you face that? What are you running away from? What kind of avoidance behavior are you engaged in? Next is, what is the worst thing that can happen when you take action? So I looked at that, and I said, what's the worst thing can happen when I tell him this? He can say, I don't like you, and he did. <laughs> now what happened? I experienced that, I looked at that, I saw that, and guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I didn't die. <laughs> My feelings were hurt a little bit. I lost some sleep about it, and sometimes I think about it when I drive past his house, but I'm still here. It's uncomfortable, but it's okay. It doesn't bother me anymore. I've gotten used to it now. So what is the worst thing that can happen? I want you to visualize that, experience that, feel the nervousness and the discomfort. And the more you run it in your mind, the less power that it will have. Next is, how will you feel after taking this action? I felt a sense of personal achievement when I face somebody that has been my mentor for years. And for years, there was something I wanted to tell him. And I didn't have the courage to tell him because it was always I was the student, he was the teacher. It was always I looked up to him and admired him and held him in high esteem. And I was always grateful and thankful for the impact that he had on my life. And I loved him so much. I didn't have the courage to say to him, please stop drinking so much, you're an alcoholic, you need help. I didn't have the courage because I was afraid that he might not like me. I was afraid that he might be hurt and crushed, that we would no longer be friends. I didn't want to jeopardize what we had. I loved him a great deal, and I didn't, I didn't know how this would affect our relationship. And I didn't even want him to know that I knew that he was an alcoholic. And so I was a coward. I was spineless. In the name of love, I did it to justify to myself to, to stop from helping somebody that I love from dying. I said, I love him so much, I just can't tell him this. I, I, I don't even know how he would handle it to know that I know that he's an alcoholic. And finally, after years, I developed the courage to face my teacher, my mentor who has molded me, who looks at me now and wanted to do what I'm doing now and did not do it, came at a different time and it wasn't time for what he brought. And he's living through me and I had to face this man who's been like a father to me and say, I gotta tell you something. You've got a problem. I love you very much. Please stop drinking. You're killing yourself. It's not just social. You do it every day. You need help. And whatever I can do to support you in that, I will. But please stop. And he looked at me, and I had no idea what, how he was going to handle that. And first there was like, I dare you. And we just looked at each other. And then I reached out to embrace him. And we've never ever embraced men, macho, we never hugged before. I hugged him and he just stood there with his arms straight. He couldn't raise his arms to hug me back. And he was shocked. And after he got over the initial shock, when he could bring himself to speak, to maintain his composure, because he could never afford to let me, his student, see him vulnerable or admit that I was right. He said, I'll be seeing you. 
And I said, yes, sir. I said, tell your wife I'll be by the house to see, see you all before I leave. And when he walked away, at first I was very depressed about it. And I said, well, maybe it wasn't my place to do this. And you know, when you act, you're going to have some second thoughts. And then I said, no, no, no. I did what I felt. I did it because I feel very strongly about this. And fortunately, he called me back a few weeks later and left word with the answering service. Leslie Brown, I just want to say thank you. And hung up. That was a good feeling. When we look out on our lives, you ask the question, what are you going to do? Look at, as you think about this that you know you need to handle, what are you going to do? And then write down three strong reasons on why you know you must take action. And be explicit and descriptive in your reasons because your reasons have power. Your reasons will drive you. When you have doubt, when your faith becomes weak, your reasons will fortify your faith. When you have an inner conversation, say, no, don't do that. Your reasons will become your rod and your staff to comfort you, to take you through those challenging moments. So write down your reasons. And what you will find, that when you decide to act, when you decide to take life on, and let me warn you, it can be painful, it will be uncomfortable, and that's where the growth is. When you're uncomfortable, when you're stretching out, when you're taking life by the collar, you're going to get thrown to the ground again and again and again. But when you have determination and you know that what you're doing is right, it gives you your life, it gives a special meaning and power to you, you will have some power from on high. You will discover some things about yourself that will begin to electrify your personality. You begin to discover some things about you that you don't know you've got when you put yourself in that type of challenging situation. Repeat after me, please. I can go into action, go into action. On, anything on anything in my life. Nothing is stopping me but me. No challenge in my life has any power over me. Here's something that Howard Thurman wrote on the decision to act. He said, it's a wondrous thing that a decision to act releases energy in the personality. For days on end, a person may drift along without much energy, having no particular sense of direction and having no will to change. Then something happens to alter the pattern. It may be something very simple and inconsequential in itself, but it stabs awake it alarms, it disturbs. In a flash, one gets a vivid picture of oneself and it passes. The result is decision, sharp, definitive decision. In the wake of the decision, yes, even as a part of the decision itself, energy is released. The act of decision sweeps all before it and the life of the individual may be changed forever when you decide to make decisions to act you begin to access power within you that will increase your self-esteem that will increase and enhance your personal power that that puts you in charge of life and life has a whole new meaning for you as a sense of personal freedom doesn't mean you're not going to have any struggles doesn't mean that you're not going to have any challenges doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer any defeats no 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 it doesn't mean that but what it does mean that you're putting yourself in the position to grow you're putting yourself in line with your higher calling and your higher self and that's what life is about.
Woo!